Images of protests and demonstrations from the contentious Supreme Court confirmation vote of Brett Kavanaugh can still be seen on just about every social media platform. The photographs capture more than just moments in time. They also reveal a social movement in our nation that will likely go down in history. Whose Streets, Our Streets, an exhibition now at RIT, bears a familiar likeness to the types of imagery we're seeing in the midst of our current political climate. This eye-opening exhibition features the work of a cohort of photographers who captured a myriad of social issues in New York City that led to marches, demonstrations, and protests in the late 20th century and turn of the millennium. So how does social documentary photography further democracy? That's what the exhibit explores and what we'll examine right now with key figures involved in this unique display of work. Joining me for this conversation, photojournalists Joseph Rodriguez and Donna Binder. In addition, co-curator and photo editor of the exhibition, Meg Handler, and historian Victoria Walcott of the University of Buffalo. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for being thank here. You. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you for having us. Regardless of where you stand on the Supreme <clears throat> Court confirmation vote of Brett Kavanaugh, when you see the images of the protests and the demonstrations taking place around the country, many focused on standing in solidarity uh, for survivors of sexual violence, I want to know what are your thoughts given your background and your expertise. And I'll give this first to you, Joseph. Well, I'm just, um, I go back to the 70s. I, I remember the women's movement. I was marching then as a youngster, and we, there was a lot of social issues going on at the same time. We had the, the Vietnam War, we had civil rights issues. So I grew up out of that generation, and so I, I see now a new movement for my daughters, for example, who are now you know, uh, younger and, and see the Kavanaugh situation and just get enamored and get sh strong to want to get out there and, and put their voices out there because they're really, really concerned about the number one issue for them right now would be turning Roe Ro versus Wade back. And, and I, I just saw all the hard work that was made back then in my earlier days to make that movement uh, or make that, that law come to fruition. So I, I see that now today. Well, Whose Streets, Our Streets opens today at RIT's Harris Gallery. And Meg, as co-curator and photo editor of the exhibition, I want you to please explain the concept, just uh, how this was developed, the timing of this exhibition, and really its purpose and intent. Well, the exhibition came, uh, the idea for it came out of a conversation between me and my co-curator, Tamar Carroll. Tamar was working on a book called Mobilizing New York, which is a history of protest movements in New York City. And through those conversations, I realized that uh, there is a sort of companion idea of a photographic exhibition, that the history was very robust. There was an overwhelming amount of images that not only I made, but the photographers at the table made and the 35 other people that were involved, and um, the subject matter was also very diverse, um, you know, reproductive rights and uh, ACT UP and housing and education, and there were so many things we were talking about and photographing, so, um, you know, we decided to contain it within uh, the time period of 1980 to 2000 because we thought that that was a period of time that hadn't really been looked at yet by photo historians. Um, and the first iteration of the show, which opened at the Bronx Documentary Center in New York, um, opened the week before uh, Donald Trump's inauguration. And the timing uh, was perfect and uh, organic. We hadn't uh, planned to open it before the inauguration, but that's what happened. Um, and I think that the timing of it allowed people to be a little bit more inspired, to have a little bit more energy and push behind them to go out onto the streets themselves, which kind of brings us around to Kavanaugh and what an inspiration that was to see the resurgence and to experience it in real time because of social media. Um, so we're you know, we're very happy to bring the exhibition and these ideas and this history to another city, a bigger city and a bigger gallery. Mm -hmm. um, and to have historians like Tamar and Victoria involved with our work kind of adds another layer to it. 
Meg, you mentioned some of the social issues that this exhibit brings about, discusses uh, abortion rights, housing, race relations, police brutality, the AIDS epidemic, and more. Mm -hmm. Victoria, if you will, what was happening in New York City at mm -hmm. the end of the 20th century, the turn of the millennium, in regards to social change? And how did these movements, uh, these activists, this, what we see taking place through this exhibition, how did that impact the rest of the country? Uh, it's a great question. So one of the things that's so powerful about this exhibit and Tamar's work um, as well is that people think of the 80s and the early 90s as a period of conservatism, uh, sort of backlash against second wave feminism, backlash against the long civil rights movement. And there's certainly much to be said for that. And what's hidden, though, in that history are these multiple kind of interlinked protest movements um, act up and in response to the AIDS crisis, the reproductive rights movement as the Supreme Court becomes increasingly conservative. Um, when Reagan starts appointing justices. Uh, the housing struggles, you know, people are familiar with the musical Rent, for example, which documents some of those struggles. So this exhibit really brings that to life. Uh, and those movements were not just in New York City, not just in Manhattan, although that's where they're extremely visible. They were national and even international movements, if you think about the struggles in Central America and, and elsewhere. So it's a somewhat of a hidden history that's only now really being told. Joseph, Donna, and Meg, you two on the ground during this period of time. I want take us. I want to know what it was like. So I'm, I'm going to give this to you first, Donna. What was the experience like for you? What were you? I know, and just reproductive rights, uh, one area of focus for you in terms of your work. Uh, talk about what drove what you did. Um, well, I think there was so much going on, um, and as a photojournalist, um, you kind of needed to be everywhere or I felt like I did. So I covered a wide array of things. I think I started out with a lot of um, issues of homelessness, definitely reproductive issues. One of the first things I photographed as a young photographer were the sit-ins at Columbia uh, about the anti-apartheid movement. Um, and that was amazing, uh, powerful, and, and you could see how protests changed things. I mean, the calls for divestment and how the university responded. Um, and I think as a photographer during that time, having grown up um, in the 60s and 70s looking at images of the civil rights movement, um, for me, I felt like this is history that I am seeing and will be later, and it's important how you document things, um, or that you do document. And we were constantly being marginalized by, by the police as we covered events. I mean. Uh, and especially uh, as a female photographer, I think that I was always the first one that they would like pull out mm -hmm. and take my press pass and then try to teach me a lesson and have me come down to the precinct to have a meeting with them. Ever fearful, ever, ever uh, in a position where uh, you were fearful. Well, or yeah, but, or intimidated, intimidated. but like I, I think that um, it didn't work because it sort of made us a little more fearless in photographing. Um, and like, as you can see in the show, there was so so many different issues and a lot of different photographers focusing ultimately on, on different things, but um, in a way it was all interconnected, as you've said, about what was going on at, at, in, at the time. Um, yeah. In an interview, Meg said that the photographers uh, featured in this exhibit blended activism with their photographic practice. They are progressive thinkers. Joseph, is this something that you intentionally set out to do, to blend activism with your craft? Well, I think my, my story is, is kind of personal. Growing up as, as a Puerto Rican New Yorker, you know, I experienced firsthand all the issues that I photograph. So everything I'm photographing is very subjective. So I spent years and years photographing in a community that I, that I kind of grew up with called Spanish Harlem. So those issues were housing, was something always being dealt with, AIDS, teenage pregnancy, education issues employment issues, these were things that I grew up with. And as a child, you know, I grew up with watching documentaries on television mm -hmm. and, and seeing our newspapers and, and watching still images that were making impacts on my mind as a young person. And that's why I guess I fell into this world of photojournalism because the power of the photograph does change things in our country. It has in the past. I had the question I posed at the beginning, in what ways does social documentary photography further democracy? How does that happen? Well, I think that it puts a mirror up for people. I think that the audience looking at our pictures or the pictures of other photojournalists, they either see themselves 
somehow in these pictures, or they see people in a way that they've never seen them. So, for example, you know, I spent a lot of time photographing the anti-abortion movement because I, I wanted to understand them and where they were coming from and not be angry about it or exploitive or use their propaganda. I, I tried to see them as, as whole individual people. And I don't think that people were used to looking at images like that. They were used to the signage and the exploitation of the idea. And um, so that was always my intent, was to, to, to show people in another light, because I thought that that did educate and it did open up people's eyes to other cultures, other ways of thinking, other politics. We were talking about social media before we, we just got this interview started with so many images that we can see on social media nowadays. Is that, does that change the impact uh, of some of these movements, or do you think it helps to further the cause? But, I mean, I, I, I think both. I think the idea and the, the Kavanaugh protests were a perfect example of being able to experience the resistance and the opposition in real time and to also see how the administration was responding to it and how all of these senators on the Judiciary Committee, I mean, it's constant commentary resistance, commentary resistance. It was, it was kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, before we close, and we've got 30 seconds left, and I'm sorry to do this in such a short period of time, and Victoria, I'm giving this to you. Uh, how do you think an exhibit like this just can open minds and kind of further us in this, in this time period that we're in right now? I think it can show the power of media, whichever kind of media you're talking about, um, to create real social change and also create a kind of radical empathy um, and to give dignity to the homeless, for example, or to somebody who's suffering from AIDS. Uh, that's what photography does. It gives that dignity dignity and allows for empathy. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. But a huge thank you to my guests for, thank thank for you. being thank here you. and joining me today. Do not miss this exhibition. Whose Streets, Our Streets is now in Rochester and opening today at RIT's Harris Gallery. The exhibition will run through November 2nd. For more information and gallery hours, go to whosestreets.photo.